नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू पब्लिक फोरम आई एम शाहरुख कार्तिके द राइट्स टू एजुकेशन एक्ट 2009 हैज completed 4 years of enactment and 3 years of implementation in this period there has been some progress as far as educational infrastructure in the country is concerned but right now even as the act completes 4 years or rather 3 years of implementation the opinion continues to be divided as to how much have how, how much has the country achieved uh, as far as the various deficiencies in our education sector is concerned in this edition of public forum over the next uh, course of uh, next 1 uh, hour i'll be trying to find out what have been the various achievements in the last 3 years and what are the challenges that still remain to be met as far as the right to education act is concerned so all of that and much more in this edition of public forum I have a fantastic panel of experts with me in the studio today to try to better understand what have been the achievements of the R Right to Education Act and what are the challenges that still lie ahead. In the studio with me today, Urmila Sarkar, Chief of Education, UNICEF India. Urmila, welcome to Public Forum. Hello. Thank you. Amit Kaushik, well-known educationist, managing director with Educom, and also formerly with the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. Amit, thank you so much for coming here. And right here with me, Urmi Goswami, special correspondent with Economic Times. Urmi, welcome to Public Forum. Thank you. Urmila, first of all, I would like to begin with you. Uh, as the act completes its third anniversary there have been there has been a lot of assessment and it is coming out daily even on television in newspapers the opinion clearly is divided while a lot of people are praising the progress that has been made some are saying that uh, much more remains to be done while there are certain others who are saying that absolutely nothing has been achieved and this whole this act has been a sham a hoax your take on 3 years of rte I think well I I remember being on this show 3 years ago and actually every year and and it's great that you do this show to review um where we are in terms of right to education and I would say it's both we have seen progress but I would also say there is quite a bit to do to achieve many of the targets set under the act um in terms of progress anyway India has made enormous progress universalizing access to primary education which we've discussed in the past even on this show and other forums in the last 10 years and in the last um Three years during the time of RTE implementation, we've seen 11 more million children enrolled in the schools. We've seen millions of post sanctions for teachers. We've seen substantial structural reform in teacher education. Um, the budget of SSA has increased by double in the years that the right to education or the budget for education sector allocation has increased by double in the right uh, since the right to education has been enacted. So these are all signs of hope or progress. But at the same time, that's alongside how much remains to be done. because what we see is there's still millions of children there's still 8 million children out of school and all those children need to be mainstreamed into age appropriate class under the act which is a huge challenge for many state governments there's still about 80 million children that are not able to complete the full cycle of elementary education um that number has not um uh come down as much as we would have liked in the last 3 years um we see classrooms across the country um still characterized by rote learning by discrimination in the classroom and by more a teacher centered method instead of the kind of child center and participatory learning approach that is called for by the act um there's still quite a bit of work to do in terms of ensuring that the community um has ownership of the schools and that we have uh school management committees that are functional because this is very critical to ensuring right to education compliance but i would still end on a sign of hope that there's still quite a bit of resources to expend on education and what i think would be critical is that state governments with civil society take stock of what needs to be done so yes i've seen in the reports and the media there's um there is pessimism around the act but i would say it's actually a call for hope a call to action hmm. to say with an urgency that how much can we fulfill in terms of those rt commitments okay. as quickly as possible okay that's that's quite a, a positive uh, interpretation of all that has been coming out i mean uh, the three years the deadline of three years was was for infrastructure and certain other provisions laid down by the rt first of all how do you take a look how how do you look at these provisions which were talked about as far as this this compliance period of three years is concerned well i think uh, the act made it quite clear that at least in terms of the basic norms uh, of making sure that there were adequate classrooms adequate uh, teachers uh, properly trained teachers uh and and so on um that a three year window was at that time considered adequate to uh to complete the the uh, gaps that were missing 
But unfortunately, what we're seeing now is that the state governments are um, uh, increasingly of the view that this is not a timeline that they're going to be able to meet. Mm -hmm. We have seen newspaper reports where the Delhi government, for example, the chief minister has assured all the uh, so-called unrecognized private schools that uh, the deadline will not be implemented and that they need not fear being penalized and so on. And I, I saw another report somewhere in one of the newspapers that some 16 uh, states have written to the Ministry of HRD hmm. seeking exemptions from various uh, provisions of the Act. Hmm. Um, what that seems to point to is that perhaps there was some underestimation uh, at the time th the Act was, uh, uh, was, was passed uh, about the scale of the task perhaps. Okay. Uh, and yes, I agree with Urmila, we've done rather well on the, on the access front and there certainly have been uh, many more schools available to children. Both, I would hasten to add, in the public as well as the private space. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, there are far more children who are currently enrolled in school. I, I'm not quite so sure about whether they're actually attending school or not. Yeah. But they are definitely enrolled in school. In fact, if you look at the if you look at the last Asar report, uh, it says that while all this has happened, all this provisioning has happened. Learning outcomes. Not I'm not going to learning outcomes this okay. time. Okay. Um, the attendance of teachers and children mm -hmm. in school mm -hmm. has actually fallen this year. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. clearly, then there is a mismatch between the provisioning and the availability of all the teachers and their actual mm -hmm. attendance and performance in class. Mm -hmm. So I think when you look at these kinds of things, perhaps we have underestimated the scale of what needs to be done to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with, with Urmila that there is a lot more that needs to be done. The last thing I would say is on this particular aspect of, of, of the act is that um, I had the great good fortune of being uh, in a position where I got to work with people who were actually creating this, this uh, historic piece of legislation. Um, and among the many discussions that took place in those days, one was that this would only be the first of many acts that would follow, okay. which, would, uh, which would address different types of problems that exist in, this, in the school space or in the education space. Okay. What we have seen now is that the entire discussion has centered around this one act that mm. is three years old mm. uh, to, the entire, to, the, to the complete exclusion of any other uh, form of legislation or regulation mm. uh, or even policy guideline mm. uh, that could perhaps uh, you know um, guide the uh, uh, the other aspects that, that right. have been left out of uh, consideration right. here that's that's a fair point but we this this failure by various schools across the country to comply with the provisions laid down in the deadline of three years this could be looked upon as one, as Amit says, an underestimation of the time that actually would, you would have taken. But there is also another way to look at it, which some people have been pointing out, that this, this, this shows a lack of political will, which political leadership must be accountable for as the laws laid down, because it makes education an entitlement. It makes good infrastructure an entitlement. It makes adequate space in school an entitlement. And if the government has not been able to, uh, to guarantee that uh, uh, parents and uh, children receive this and the government must be held accountable. Does it, what does it mean to you? An underestimation or a lack of political it's will? actually no one factor. Yes, there is an underestimation yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, and true. there is also a lack of political will. There's also this very typically Indian mindset. You make a law and then all your, as if the law, you know, the law is there and your problems are gone. Hmm. The law is just an enabler. This hmm. law was to help enable children between the ages of 6 and 14 mm. to actually access their fundamental right. Mm. So now that the law is in place, you have to implement it. Mm. And that is where the problem arises. So yes, it is a, it's all of, all of the above. Mm. There's also the additional uh, thing, which is, a, uh, which is a question of events that we now obviously seem to have forgotten, is that though the act was enforced from 1st April 2010, yeah. It effectively started, actually serious <coughs> work started only a year later because the law was taken to, I mean, it was challenged in the yeah. Supreme Court. Yeah. So y should the government have gone back and asked for an extension? Should it have sought to amend the law for a further, uh, for, a, for a relaxation of the uh, target uh, deadline? Th there were, there's a divided house on that. So it's a lot of mismanagement in terms of time, in terms of uh, how you plan your uh, you know targets and also you know you have to plan your implementation properly the lack of will 
is there. I mean, the very fact that it took us 60 years to actually make education, basic education a fundamental a right should tell us something about how we prioritize basic education. Just because we have been talking about it for the last 15 years, and no matter how routine the, the conversation has become, one is happy that the conversation is on because mm. you are talking, we are at least talking about it as, a, as an issue. But the fact is that it took us 60 years to wake up and make something out of it. Mm. Actually, maybe a little less than uh, 60 years because in 1996 you had the only Christian case. But, but still, it took you so long. Mm. Urmila, the, the larger question behind missing this deadline is, I mean, the deadline can be missed, fine, no problem. You can be given another uh, year of extension. You can be given mm. two more years of extension. You can give, be given three more years of extension. But taking a look, at the state of infrastructure right now across the country. Do you think another two years or another three years would have made any difference or, or a very significant difference? Mm -hmm. I you, think we, we can, we can mm -hmm. approach this question another way also. How much actually has been the progress, has been the progress achieved only as far as inf infrastructure is concerned in the last three years? Right, I mean, it, it, in terms of infrastructure, actually when you look at official uh, data, um, actually from various sources, you find so, uh, quite a bit of progress on separate toilets, for example, for girls and boys, and access to drinking water and water facilities in general, which, uh, which is, is interesting because that's also in line with the Supreme Court judgment, which was there on toilets. I think that also helped. And that was interesting um, because at UNICEF, we've actually been doing our own stock taking and looking at the data. What we, but we, what we found at the same time in terms of infrastructure is m some states are really lagging behind in ensuring a library in every school, um, in ensuring um, uh, the proper uh, teaching learning material and in some, some of the other aspects, boundary wall ramps, these actually are quite low when you mm. look at the national averages. That's in terms of infrastructure, but when we go back to the question of, um, you know, would it have made a difference to have two more years? I mean, that goes back to the political will um, that Urmi was mentioning, because whether you have two years, five years, it is about political will ultimately. I think yeah. anything is possible um, if, if you have uh, the political will behind you. But on top of that, you need to have a very methodical approach to dealing with it. So you need political will, but also a very uh, methodical and systematic approach, particularly by state government with civil society. But then I would agree with Amit's point about the timing issue, the adequate timing. So I think what's critical now is that states really take stock, really discuss the government, the civil society, the media, where are we in terms of RTE, and then make realistic assessments of what can be done. Hmm. And there are quick wins that can be, it, there are certain one-time investments, like ensuring a library that's used yeah. by can you, teachers Can you children. put a number to the, when you talk about the performance of the states, which states have been doing well, or rather how many approximately have been doing well, and how many have not? When we look overall, like in terms of um, the state for drinking water facilities, toilets for girls and boys, actually across the board, the average is pretty good. Um, we, we have it at about uh, 70, 80 percent, something like that. But then, but that's not to look at individual states, but generally the averages are pretty good. Okay. And actually, um, and, and on the different site, we have actually put the, the specific data. But there are some states, four or five states in particular, Bihar and others, where you see it's not doing very well yeah. in terms of library, in terms of ramps, and if you're looking at children with special needs, okay. where there's still a lot of work to do. Okay. Um, but, but the last point I would make is that, that it, there are certain one-time investments that can be made that would make a big difference in terms of achieving the right to education targets. Um, and even sanctioning the posts for teachers, all of that, you see an improved pupil-teacher ratio. You see that even though the target for teachers is not till 2015, we have to point that out, it's still another two years to yes. go yes, when sir. we're looking at training of teachers. But going back to Ahmed's point about timing, that the state governments, they need to be where how long will it take to ensure pedagogical transformation. Hmm. When we're looking at child-friendly, child-centered classrooms, free of discrimination, free of fear, that kind of work on quality, hmm. that needs to be much more seriously taken into an account what time is needed. And some of these are long-term hmm. because it's really about strengthening hmm. institutions yeah. and governance and teacher education that can't be done overnight. Right. And that's why, that's where the timing issue becomes important. But quality is something that. which is clearly, which is missing from the debate right now. It is on nobody's mind. Right. Even the uh, the assessments, uh, even the assessors of the so-called, of, of the progress or achieved of, or, or uh, the task that is yet to be done.
the quality seems to be missing in all of that debate. But as far as the infrastructure part is concerned, there are a lot of states who had, even when to, uh, RTE was being implemented, they had raised their hands and they had surrendered uh, if, uh, in effect, uh, asking the central government for more financial assistance because they said that it, they simply do not have the kind of resources that are required to implement or to take care of the enabling provisions for which this three-year deadline just expired. What has been the progress as far as the funds allocated for the education sector is concerned? All of that and much more on the other side of this very short break that we are slipping into. Stay tuned to Public Forum. Welcome back, you're watching Public Forum and today we are talking about three years of implementation of the Right to Education Act. Amit, mean, we remember when the Right to Education was enacted, several states the leading ones probably being Uttar Pradesh and Bihar had completely surrendered and they said that we just do not have the resources to implement the provisions that we are asking that you're, you're asking us to do. And, and at the end of the day, they, they had probably predicted this situation that when this deadline expires, we are going to be held accountable for not having done much. Whereas the truth is we do not have enough resources to do it. What, how do things stand right now as far as the finances to cover this sort of provisions are concerned? Well, I think uh, what we have seen in the last few years has been a significant increase in the resources generally available uh, for school education um, across the board. I mean, it's, it's not just you know uh, the central government, it's also the state governments. The degree to which each state government has been able to contribute, of course, has differed from state to state. But as a result, what we're looking at today is something like uh, if I remember the Paisa report which came out recently correctly, uh, 11,000 odd rupees per child per annum is the national average, right? So this, this varies from uh, 15,000 or 16,000 rupees in some states down to maybe seven or 8,000 rupees in some states. Okay. Now this is a number which has increased very significantly from what it used to be. Okay. Um, um, uh, in 2005 and 2006 when this act was actually being uh, debated and when it was being uh, drafted, at that stage, if I remember correctly, the figures were about 3,000 odd rupees per child per annum. So you're talking about an increase of almost 8,000 rupees per child per annum hmm. in the space of about five years or so. That, that is a significant increase. But that said, uh, I'm associated with a group that runs private schools. And our costs of running a good, high quality private school are almost about 10 times as much. Hmm. Now, what you said before the break, the issue of quality is one that is somehow being left out of this entire debate. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've seen uh, endless numbers of reports uh, from independent groups, from the government themselves, showing that children are not learning despite all this money that is being spent. Where does this leave us? Is this act, the question I have today is, is this act actually enough? Or should we be looking at what else can civil society do? I take Urmila's point, the point she made about the need for civil society, government agencies, for NGOs and everybody to sit together, take stock of where we stand and decide what else needs to be done. I think we need to widen the debate and go beyond the Right to Education Act itself and look at what other thing needs, uh, things need to happen. Yes, education must, free and compulsory education must be a right for all children in this country. About that there can be no doubt at all. Yes, government has the role and the responsibility of ensuring that such education is made available to such children. But does government have to be delivering this education is a question that we, I think, need to start asking uh, mm -hmm. now. Government used to be in the business of making scooters, look where that went. Government used to be in the business of making bread, look where that went. Government is still in the business of running the airlines and uh, look where, where what's happening there. I think, and I, I'm not, I'm not, let me, let me make it clear that I'm not advocating a drastic shift in, a, in how we look at education or a, or a completely revolutionary a change of philosophy, I'm not. Hmm. All I am saying it, is that there is the space for a lot more players than only government and if the fact that it is only government or largely government hmm. who is the service provider in this case is holding up progress, hmm. then it's time we take a very hard look at where we are 
and look at what might be other options. Okay. Urmi, mm -hmm. your assessment of the funding part of it, has the funding in the last three years gone up significantly, both central allocation and states allocation? Okay. Let me just make one statement before I move to funding because the funding question is very simple. You look at the budget papers and you know that funding has gone up. I mean, there are no two ways about it. Of course, you must also remember that a 2% cess has been put on all, uh, all, all people who pay any kind of tax direct and indirect from 2004. Hmm. And that cess now accounts for 60% of the funding for the Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, which is the vehicle through which the RTE is being okay. implemented. Okay. But that apart. I think it is time we understand one thing, quality and the issue of who is running the show is, they're not, they're mutually exclusive questions actually. Hmm. Quality is also sometimes about doing things right within the same amount of outlay or with a little imagination. Let me give you a small example. A week ahead of the 31st March deadline, the Ministry of Human Resource Development gave a relaxation to 13 states which includes UP, Bihar, West Bengal, okay. uh, for uh, on the issue of teachers. Now, the deadline, 31st March deadline, was for the for the pupil teacher ratio. Hmm. They didn't have enough teachers. There's an 11 lakh uh, shortage, shortage yeah. of teachers. Hmm. So the relaxation was given that you can take in untrained teachers, and you know over the next uh, what do you call two years? That's 2015 is the deadline for training. Hmm. You train, you train these them. people. Yeah. Now, this is a matter of imagination. This should have struck cent the central government or the state government mm. much before. Mm. We didn't have to come to a crisis situation, you know, on 21st of March or 15th of March and say, oh, let's give this relaxation. Mm. Imagination. Do you really need a very highly trained teacher if you're teaching classes one and two? Mm. Can you not manage, given the situation that in the ideal world, everybody should be trained. We don't live in an ideal world. We live in an actually resource scarce world. So we should stop pretending that we live in a world where we have all these people begging to be teachers. We don't. We also live in a country which has about 82 districts now classified as left-wing extremist affected districts. You are not going to get anybody to go there for love or for money. Definitely not for love. I don't know about, definitely also not for money. <laughs> so therefore, you have to find ways to beat the system. How do I beat the system? I find somebody maybe there who has made it till class eight or class nine. I get her to teach in classes one and two, and it is happening. Hmm. So you have to show imagination. Quality is about imagination, interest. It is also about money. It is also about resources. I have consistently maintained that... Would you, would you say that the RT is responsible for sort of firing this imagination? You know, imagination doesn't come easy to us. Hmm. You know, and I don't think it's the RT. It's just us. We don't seem to have an imagination. Now, like, we are always caught up on this question of quality. Hmm. I, I love to... Un I mean, I'm told quality means trained teachers. I want to know what these trained teachers means. Hmm. Where are we go? Do I want kids... What do I want my kids, kids to go to school for? So that they have hope, so that they can be the best they can be. Mm. If I'm not giving that to them, mm. if they're learning nothing for mm. reasons that have nothing to do, for no fault of their own, there is a problem. Mm. So I think finances is one thing. Yes, we should be looking at finances, but the education sector gets much less than it deserves. I think it deserves way more. We are, what, at 3.7 percent of GDP in 1966. The Kothari Commission said 6 percent. In 2004, UPA once said, we'll give you 6 percent in five years' time. Yeah. Five years have come and gone, gone and we are still at 3.7 percent. Yeah. So yes, I would like more money. Yeah. But first, you know, it's like, hmm. ask anybody there are changes the household. That, there are changes that can manage. be brought about in, this, in, in the money it's that you have right now. It's a matter right of attitude. Yeah. Yeah, I think showing more money at the problem is not going to make it go away. I agree with Urmi there. Right. Uh, there is a need to be more creative and more imaginative in hmm. the solutions that you find, hmm. and which can be done within the resources that are available. Right. Yes. But my limited point is that all imagination and creativity does not lie within government. Right. Sometimes hmm. it lies okay. outside as well. Okay, I'll, I'll come to that subsequently. Urmila, uh, this, this is a criticism of the RT that keeps coming up repeated, uh, regularly. A lot of people talk about it, but unfortunately it's not debated much. 
a uh, lot of people say that RTE, the essential focus is on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, whether it, it, it could be the focus, when they say focus, it could be public imagination when they mean focus. But a lot of people say that the focus in RTE is mostly on infrastructure and not on learning outcomes. And mm -hmm. as was discussed after the Pratham's annual state of education report, learning outcomes have probably fallen in the last three years and not improved. What has RTE contributed to quality, to learning outcomes in the country? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would completely disagree with the statement that RTE does not address quality because I think, and I've done um, work in the past in looking at comparative reviews of compulsory education legislations from other countries um, in Asia and Europe and the UK, and it is actually one of the few pieces of legislation that I've seen hmm. that addresses quality in such a holistic way. Okay. So I would t totally disagree, and even in looking at the basic parameters of the Act and the Annex, there are important quality indicators on teaching learning materials, on pupil-teacher ratio, and then within the text of the legislation itself, there's a whole section 29 that's devoted to child-centered curriculum. Um, there, there are a lot. Uh, there are a number of provisions around uh, the the qualifications of teachers and so forth. I think the issue is more not so much about what's in the legislation and the provisions, but it is a bit about imagination. I would actually agree with that point. And how do we define quality? I mean, it's in the legislation, but the legislation is not the place to be looking for the step-by-step -step approach to how we're going to transform classrooms. And what I think needs to be done on a very urgent basis is for civil society, state governments to come together and say, how are we going to transform classrooms? And there are ways to do this. There are ways, when, when we talk about continuous comprehensive assessment in the legislation, it's one of the weakest implemented provisions in the legislation. Have, have, has it been looked at seriously enough? Do, do people understand what it means? Does the teacher understand what it means? Yeah. So there, th uh, in that, fact, I, I was, think, in fact, I, I was, going, I was going to come to that because you said imagination. I, I started thinking about C C CCE. Do people understand the various provisions of CCE? They seem pretty imaginative to me, but I also see a lot of resentment among the teachers, among the exactly. teachers themselves, exactly. as far as the CCE is concerned. And do people, and do people understand what CCE means? Do people understand it has to to do with individual learning pays, it has to do with milestones for the children. It actually makes it a bit easier if you have children. See, if you're looking at mainstreaming children from out of school that have no foundational literacy and then they have to catch up to age appropriate class, then what kind of a strategy are you going to have to do that? CCE is actually a way to integrate the differential learning paces of different children. But does the teacher understand that? Does the community or the parent understand that? So this kind of, I think it's just looking at a very serious and systematic approach to dealing with quality. And then I wanted to just go back to Amit's point about being innovative in partnership. Because I think right to education, and I use the example of the School Excellence Program in Mumbai, which was stimulated by right to education, where the public sector came together with the private sector to address learning outcomes for urban slum children. And it was the municipality of Greater Mumbai, but a number of corporates, NGOs, civil society, and the civil society NGOs that have practical experience in effective teaching and learning process that came together to look at school leadership management and improving learning outcomes. And I've visited uh, the, the initiative after uh, two years of implementation, and we've seen progress. So this is the kind of thing that we see in Mumbai, but it, we need to see it across the country. Okay. I mean, that's the problem. Okay. Well, on that note, it's time for me to slip into yet another break. But on the other side, there was one more objective that was being talked about when right to education was being debated upon, and that was making education inclusive, bringing under the umbrella of education a lot of people who still did not have access to it. For example, uh, people from children from economically weaker sections, for example, children with special needs. There have been a lot of beautiful stories throughout the country which show that probably this has been done. But taking a look, but a holistic assessment, how much has that, has that been able, how much a uh, country has been able to achieve on that respect, all that and much more on the other side of this short break. Do stay tuned to Public Forum. Welcome back, you're watching Public Forum and today we're talking about the challenges ahead as far as the Right to Education Act is concerned.
I mean, last week we saw a very beautiful report in a national daily about uh, a couple of schools in Mumbai, which were there, uh, which were for, which had been designed for especially uh, for for children with special needs, and now they are celebrating their closure because they say that the act. Uh, their 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 objective or the, the the dream that they had been fighting for is the inclusion of children with special needs with regular children in regular schools has been met and it is the right of education right to education act that has that has made this dream possible has rt uh, lent an, a, an an air of 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 accessibility of inclusion to school education in the country I think definitely uh, uh, the the philosophy behind the uh, act was very clearly one of uh, inclusion. It was one uh, very clearly of making sure that children received what was legitimately due to them, and that meant all children, regardless of birth and where they came from or whether they had physical or other disability, treating all children as equal and making sure that each child has equal access to. Uh, educational opportunity, which is great. That's the way it should be. Uh, but you know, sometimes in this whole discussion about, uh, this, for example, the story that you mentioned, you know, a school that was running, uh, focusing on on children with special needs and how those children have been mainstreamed into private schools, we tend to sort of uh, miss the fact that a lot of first, a lot of private schools have already been doing this for many years. There are a large number of schools in this country who do, who are completely inclusive, mm -hmm. and they include children with disabilities. They include children from economically poorer uh, backgrounds, mm. regardless of where they come from. Second, the number of schools that are actually under private management is a very small number, right? The large majority of schools are government schools. My question is, while this was a happy success uh, story with uh, a success story with a happy ending. Uh, how many government schools today hmm. are actually ready to be inclusive? That is a serious concern. Hmm. You know, if you go into uh, small villages in, say, rural Madhya Pradesh or rural Uttar Pradesh or rural Bihar, where caste equations still hold uh, sway, hmm. you will find that that's not a, in, an inclusive classroom at all. Hmm. And it doesn't matter whether the child is with it with disability, without disability. Hmm. That's a that's a classroom where the ch where children are treated differently based on which caste background they come from. And RT has been able to make no difference RT to that. RT cannot make a difference to this because RT is an is an act that governs how education is transacted in the country. Mm -hmm. It does not govern the social order, nor does it have provisions for changing the social order. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that in most of these the in in the kinds of situations that I'm describing, mm -hmm. the most of the children who are present in that classroom actually come from socially and economically disadvantaged groups. Whereas the teacher, very typically, will be somebody who's from one of the forward castes, mm. so-called. Yeah. And that means that these kids and their parents, for example, when we talk about community engagement with the school, mm. these are people who are going to deal with that teacher from a position of disempowerment to start with. Mm. Then how are you going to change that and make that an inclusive classroom? Right. I think those are the larger concerns that we should be looking at. Ulmi, your take on that. Yes, it, inclusive is a nice word, but it's a very complicated and complex Absolutely. situation. And uh, you know, I mean, I mean, there's no point in repeating what Amit said because that's really the case. But I think again, certain interventions can be made. These are complexities that exist, and we have to find ways to work around them. And I think one of the problems that the RT has, and it, I, it's not all, it's not really a, the problem just for the legislation, it's again a mindset thing, is that on one hand, we, there is, there's an immense amount of centralization. It's a, you know, how you look at quality and what you understand are quality parameters. And the other side, there is a lot of, uh, you know, decentralization in terms of who the final authority is, whether it's the district or the state or the central government. And I think what needs to change is there needs to be more space for each school. So each school, each teacher should be able to define how she manages, she or he manages their classroom or how each headmistress or headmaster manages their school. But the simple reason is that you could have a situation whereby you have a class which is, uh, has got more, more kids from disadvantaged communities and a forward, uh, forward caste teacher or it could be you know, a class of you know uh, disadvantaged uh, kids and a disadvantaged teacher from a disadvantaged community. How a teacher mediates 
you know, learning in her classroom should be left to that. And that is one of the big problems. It's not an RTE problem. Let me be very specific. Okay. It's, it's a, a social issue. It's mm. a, not it's only a social, social issue, it's social also issue. the way we have sort of understood education and mm. learning. Mm. Our learning has over the years become a very textbook focused learning. Mm. And no matter how we dress it up, child centric, or rote learning or mm. whichever whichever way you go it it revolves around the textbook now in mm. some cases it's because of lack of resources and lack of i don't mean just in terms of money now let's say uh, in a very backward village you give them money for a computer mm. but there is no electricity so thank you so much what do i do with the money for the computer yeah. Yeah. so you have to allow the teacher that space to make learning interesting for our kids by making it relate to issues that are around. Mm -hmm. Should the child not learn about computers? Of course not, they should. But do I have to actually, where the computer comes in into their lives and at what point and how and how is, there, is something that I should leave it to the teacher. Yeah. And I think though, if I'm not saying that the problems of social inclusion, which are which is what the issue of inclusion is, uh, will be addressed like that. But I believe that you can mitigate some of the difficulties. Okay. You know, because you, the guy who is there at that spot makes the right assessment. If you're sitting, whether you're sitting in Patna or New Delhi or Lucknow, it's very difficult to make an assessment of what's happening, say, in uh, Begusarai. Okay, you yeah. Know? Urmila, the contribution of RTE for promoting inclusive school education. Well, I think, I mean, again, it's a, it's a unique piece of legislation when you look globally for addressing head-on the issues of inclusion and disadvantaged groups which are, within the law. Which are unique to this country. Which is unique, uh, not necessarily to India, you see it all over the world, but it's unique that it's in the, the Right to Education Act. And I would also agree that it, 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 the act alone, the legislation alone, can't address wider social issues that are embedded in society for so many years. Mm. I mean, that's the issue. But at the same time, I've always seen the Right to Education Act as an instrument for transformation. I see it as an instrument for social transformation. But then it can't be, th but then to, to make it happen, I think that's where you require innovation, imagination, and you need to look at examples of what works. So when I'm um, just hearing uh, where me and Amit speaking, I was just thinking like, what have I seen around the field that works in terms of social inclusion? And um, one example that many people know and quote is the, the Loreto School, which is actually a private school <coughs> where the sister Cyril used her imagination and came up with the idea that we have all these homeless children, traffic children, street children, why don't we bring them into this private school and have middle or upper class students interact with these children? And that kind of social integration improved the overall learning environment of the school. Um, and then we've seen across the country uh, sports and physical education being used as a way of bringing children together from different religious, d different caste and class backgrounds, and not only improving quality physical education and sport, but promoting inclusion. Um, so I think that's where we, we need to be more systematic about it, but we also need to go out of our comfort zone and do something differently. When we look at the out-of-school children today, we often talk about, uh, the, the, in, in, in recently there was a publication put out on the problems for tribal children and quality education and access for tribal children. But when you look, actually the Muslim children have so many issues when you look at the out-of-school. And are the classrooms, are the teachers able to deal with these issues? Hmm. And so it's about changing the mindset, getting out of the comfort zone, but also looking at practical examples in the field to the show how. So it's in the act, we, we know that we have to do something about it, but being more systematic from head teacher, from teacher to school administration, and the government officials themselves, hmm. and, and even the private sector, whatever, the different organizations coming together. Are we working with the representative organizations in this case? Are we working with organizations of Delhi people? Okay. Are we working with organizations of tribals to address okay. this? I would say not enough. Okay. And that's where I think the issue lies. Okay. So well, I was just one thing, that, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, because we live in cities and uh, <coughs> we tend to look at examples of things that are happening and a lot happens in our cities. It's not mm. that they're not happening. But the real test of the law, which mm. is it, which I says, sets out the ideal condition, is how it affects those who are at the margins. Yeah. And I think that is where the problem lies. We need to be able to reach those kids who are today at the margins, who are, prob who are in unserved areas, wi mm. which are in extremely backward districts. Mm. That is where, and the solutions that will work there may not be solutions that work yeah. in a Loreto convent sure. or even in the slums of Mumbai. What will work there is something where we have to get people, local people involved. Mm. And yeah. there has to be, I mean, they may not be literate, 
But I'm sure they're united in one thing, that they want the best for their children. So is the RT reaching out to them? Not enough. Not enough. Yeah. But that's a problem of implementation. It's not a problem of the law. Hmm. You know, the law, as, as Ormila has said of, uh, several times, that isn't, it sets out a lot of interesting details. But it's the ideal condition. We are far from ideal. So actually, much more effort needs to be made to act, implement it. And th there comes the issue of political will, interest. Resources. Uh, well, yeah, some resources. It's imagination, innovation. OK. It's a whole different ball game. OK. It's time for me to slip into yet another break. But on the other side of this break, in the final few minutes of this discussion, of course, there are a plethora, a plethora of, of aspects that need to be touched upon. But what could be the immediate focus areas on which some change could be, could be set in motion so that the, the objectives of right to education, we are able to achieve them better and probably in a lesser time as envisaged. So all of that and much more on the other side. Stay tuned to Public Forum. Welcome back, you're watching Public Forum and today we are talking about the right to education and challenges ahead. Urmila, I'll begin this round with you. As far as the future roadmap for RTE is concerned, the immediate focus areas. I think the immediate focus is it's time to discuss, it's time to take stock, as I said in the beginning. What has been achieved, what are the gaps, <coughs> and with a focus first on how do we promote inclusive space in the classroom, teachers as agents of change, how do we ensure the school and the community are working together, and finally the most difficult but important part is how do we strengthen institutions and governance to make right to education happen. So I think the focus right now is taking stock and seeing with how you know, with what, how quickly can we actually complete the unfinished right to education commitments? Okay, Amit. Well, I think Urmila said it all, so there's really not much <laughs> that I can add. <laughs> but what I would say in terms of immediate focus, yes, um, with everything that she said, I think um, a, a much greater focus on, on teacher training mm. and teacher empowerment, mm. because I think that really will be key <coughs> to whether this act is successfully implemented or not. Mm. And second, I think I would like to see a great deal more use of technology for, uh, for you know, assisting and facilitating the implementation of the act. Uh, from simple things like, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about you know, technology where you have uh, lesson, lessons that have been drawn up by somebody sitting in Delhi or New York. Not talking about that. I'm talking about simple things like tracking children's progress, tracking children themselves, tracking the delivery of the midday meal, which has been done, for example, very successfully in, in Uttar Pradesh, where they're doing it through the mobile phone okay. inter interactive yeah. voice response thing. Yeah. That kind of usage of technology, okay. which I think will help to keep track of what's happening, will help you to monitor each mm. rupee as it gets spent. Which, which right now is mm. being done through reams and reams of papers and it's registers. Through, well, which in some states it's being done through technology. <coughs> in some states it's being done through reams and reams of papers. But I think yeah. it's, it's not about whether uh, technology has been adopted <coughs> or not. It's about changing the mindset within government to accept large-scale deployment of technology. And I think mm. that is what something, that's something that probably is, is missing. Okay. Urmi. Well, uh, first order of business, I mean, the all should move simultaneously, <coughs> actually. Uh, one is uh, taking stock, as Urmila put it, but also looking at how, what kind of tinkering you have to do. Mm. Uh, consider the case of toilets. Uh, you have toilets, but there's a problem now about maintenance. It, you know, there's no accounting for how you ensure maintenance of these toilets. So you go and build the toilets, but maintenance doesn't happen. Okay. So within a year's time, it's as good as not having the toilet. Okay. So things like that, to make those changes, 
make up so for you mean there is there's no monitoring mechanism to ensure that a no, toilet once no, built is properly yeah, maintained how do you ensure maintenance do you have the provisions for maintenance hmm. is that enough who will okay. maintain it who will maintain it i mean presumably the school but who pays for it yeah. okay. or how much money is being allocated okay. that kind of a thing so that One will be taken care of by the school management committee if yeah, if, if, if 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 yeah, if it exists. Yeah, if it's exists. functioning, <laughs> if it's yeah. there. Yeah. 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 Okay, so the there's so many ifs and buts. So you make up for, <laughs> I mean, so make up on the targets that you have missed. Some of this, and there'll be additional issues that have cropped up over hmm. these three years while you're meeting all these infrastructure and teacher <coughs> targets. You meet. You will have to tinker around, not in the law, but in the implementation of the law. How you work around it? Do you? Uh, you know, as I said about the teacher training, do you really, maybe we don't need trained teachers at, you know, at class one or class two. Maybe we can do with, you know, teachers who have just finished class 10, 12, you know, that kind of tinkering, that, that relook. And I'm not suggesting para teachers, but, uh, you know, that kind of a relook so that we meet our infrastructure and teacher targets. Mm. That's the first order of business because mm. you need schools and you need, uh, and you need teachers to have schooling. Mm. Second and the most important part, I think, is where you empower teachers. And when I mean empower teachers, I mean give them the freedom to do things, to, to design, design learning, of course, to a certain uh, sort of set out curriculum, but design learning so their, kid, their children, the children in their classroom learn most. Hmm. And within that, please ensure accountability. Please evaluate your teachers more regularly. So, so actually, yes, we need a child-centric schooling, but we need a teacher-centric evaluation mm. where the teacher is evaluated. And the issues of inclusion, quality, these will happen. We'll have to look at it side by side. But f first, you need a school and a teacher and systems in place. And the teacher needs space so that we can then you know, start, begin to address those issues. Very often we are talking about a school should have a library. Very good, you have a library, but we don't have enough teachers in the school. Yeah. So, you know, let's not put the cart I, before the horse. I often find a lot of teachers complain that their logistics workload has increased after the RT was implemented, when after the CCE was brought yeah, into place. Yeah, yeah. Can there be done something? Uh, probably the intervention of technology, technology can make, again, can yeah, make yeah, a difference technology. to that. But what should, should is, is that is that is that the right approach? Is there is there some problem in approach when the teachers feel that their logistic workload no, has I increased? No, I think it, it, it's it's a matter <coughs> of getting used to the CCE is a new thing, and uh, and one uh, and one of the areas of failure of the RT implementation of the RT because I think not enough has been done to actually lay out what exactly CCE is and how it should be done. So everybody has said, some, some states say that like Bihar, they have actually said that continuous and comprehensive evaluation, teachers understand it to mean no examination hmm. and no evaluation, which hmm. is not the case. Yeah. Whereas in some schools, maybe in Delhi, it has meant over evaluation and over, uh, you know, much more work for the classroom teacher. Yeah. So, you know, you have this whole range of things. There hmm. has to be some kind of, uh, there has to be a better hand-holding on that. Hmm. You have to work harder at actually explaining what it is and then within that whatever variation schools and teachers want to make. But okay. basically there has to be that. And as for the complaint, I think, you know, when you transition from one system to another, change is always painful. And I think part of the complaint is about the pain of change. Hmm. So I think we, we, need to, uh, we need to reach out to our teachers to ask them uh, what they think are the problems. But and why they feel it's a problem and perhaps address them. But we will probably see that some of these things are about, you know, you, when you move away from an annual exam to a weekly exam, the pain of change is great. Hmm. So some of it could be just painful transition and some of it could be some real problems. It can be addressed, as Amit said, through technology hmm. and other such uh, well, your assessment also on the technology part of it, as Amit said, I mean, I mean, it's interesting that we're talking about technology at a time when there's a lot of uh, speculation that probably HRD is moving away from the one technological advancement that it had been talking about in the last one years, probably the Akash tablet. Yeah. Although the HRD minister has right, categorically, right. he has gone on record, he has said that uh, the technology minister, uh, minister the uh, Kapil Sibyl, who, yeah. who, whose brainchild probably it was. Mm -hmm. But still, there is speculation that HRD ministry is moving away from that emphasis on Akash. But apart from Akash, I mean, that's just, that just gives us a background to talk about technology. The, the, the potential 
of uh, of technology in in making a real impact as far as school education. Uh, is no, definitely, uh, there's a huge potential <coughs> to transform school education uh, through uh, ICT and in term in different ways in uh, in professionalization of teacher education and training, but also in terms of quality assurance system, in terms of innovative pedagogy, and really reaching out um, to some you know the northeastern states uh, could really benefit from um, information communication technology just in terms of training the teachers. I think that the issue with the Akash tablets is that it, it's definitely an interesting innovation, but there has to be a planned approach. So I would say that it's important for their public-private partnership to look at a planned approach for where are the gaps and how can we actually re realize um, RT goals through ICT because there is a huge potential in technology for realizing targets and it's, it's in terms of quality but also in terms of monitoring so you have much stronger quality assurance system and I think technology but it's just um, a tool so the the key is is how do you plan it in such a way so that the tool is used correctly and also if there are other issues around the culture of technology so when we go out to the most remote rural areas, do teachers, do students have the culture of using technology? Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of issues that need to be addressed if it's going to be fully realized. Mm -hmm. And the fact remains still when you look at um, a recent UNESCO report has come out that if you look at access to technology, it's still very difficult for the most deprived or marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. So that has to be dealt with, the equity and access of technology. Okay, fantastic. And I mean, that's all I have time for. I would have loved this discussion to go on, but that's all I have time for. Urmila Sarkar, Amit Kaushik, Urmila Goswami, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, we do seem to have come a long way as far as last three years of implementation of the Act is concerned, but as my panelists, panelists consistently argued uh, throughout the last one hour that there is a lot that needs to be done and there are several areas, some of the f uh, immediate focus areas we discussed. It remains to be seen whether uh, some, some stock taking is, uh, truly comes out in the, in the days to come and, uh, and, and what, what sort of tweaking does really happen to a surf as far as meeting the objectives, the avowed objectives of right to education is concerned. That's all I have time for in this edition of Public Forum. Thank you so much for staying tuned. Do stay tuned to Looks About Television for more. Namaskar. Thank you.